Hi everyone, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Cybology. Let's expand our mind. For those who are new, this is a series where we take a deep dive into the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature from past to present, one study at a time. Before we start, I want to say thank you to my best friend for all the support. I've sent him like 50 different iterations of the podcast logo over the past week as I've been updating it, and I really appreciate him allowing me to inundate him with all of my frantic messaging, both about the podcast and life in general. Today's episode is on the article, Some Observations on Psilocybin, a New Hallucinogen in Volunteer Subjects, published in 1960. I want to start with a brief recap of what we learned in the last episode. All we've really learned so far is that some of the effects of psilocybin are similar to those of LSD, except that psilocybin is less potent and has a shorter duration. We also learned that some early research into psilocybin was incredibly unethical and involved coerced experimentation on black Americans. I wanted to bring that up in particular to contrast it with today's article, which used paid student volunteers, specifically 12 males and 2 females, between 20 and 27 years old. Give it up for the researchers of the study from Columbia University and New York State Psychiatric Institute for having some common human decency. The researchers actually mentioned that they chose paid student volunteers specifically because they believed it would remove the potential confound from using patients, which is how Isbell, the author of the study we talked about last episode, described his subjects, who may exhibit various neurotic or psychotic symptoms and thus bias the results. They also mentioned that because previous research used a max of 8 to 10 milligram doses of psilocybin, they decided to administer doses that ranged from 8 to 36 milligrams to examine the effects of higher doses. Although in many cases we will see doses reported as milligram per 70 kilogram body weight, it appears that this study did not adjust the dose depending on the weight of the participants. Also, as a reminder for context, modern day research often uses between 10 and 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram doses. So the 14 participants came into the lab at 8 a.m. after having skipped breakfast and were administered a dose of psilocybin between 8 and 36 milligrams. Although all 14 participants received psilocybin, they were told that they could either receive psilocybin, LSD, or a placebo. Although the study design resembles a between-subjects design, where participants only receive one of the experimental conditions, in this case one of the variable doses of psilocybin, because of the small sample size, I would argue this is really a series of case studies. There were nine different possible doses of psilocybin administered, and so with only 14 participants, some of those dose conditions had a sample size of one. Before getting into the results, I also want to contrast the environment the participants were in in this study compared to the study in the last episode. Whereas the previous study used what was essentially an experimental prison ward, this study took place in a semi-darkened hospital room with a nurse, doctor, or both, present throughout the study duration, which typically went from 8 a.m. to about 3 to 5 p.m. Despite this improved environment, the authors still mention that this experimental study, conducted in a hospital setting, surrounded by unfamiliar doctors and nurses, is markedly different from the mystical and ritualistic ceremonies that use psilocybin as part of the spiritual experience. The results of this study can be split into two sections. The first focuses on what I'll call psychological responses, which include the affective, behavioral, and cognitive symptoms that the participants reported, and the second focuses on the physiological responses, such as blood pressure, pulse, etc. A lot of these findings are qualitative in nature, however, for some of the quantitative measures they report on, it's important to note they did take baseline measures so that they could discuss changes in response to the administration of psilocybin. Starting with the psychological responses, the researchers first discussed the presence of visual hallucinations and visual or auditory illusions. The former is defined by the researchers as visual perceptions for which no external stimuli were present, whereas the latter is when you either see or hear a distorted version of an existing stimulus. So for example, if you were looking at a ceiling fan and the blades of the fan started changing colors, that would be a visual illusion. Whereas if there was no ceiling fan at all, and yet you still saw one, that would be a visual hallucination. To provide examples from the actual study participants, one participant reported a visual hallucination where they saw animated candy canes presided over by a little elf, and another participant reported a visual illusion where the nurse's face looked as if it were covered with green and blue pimples. Overall, 12 out of the 14 participants reported visual hallucinations and 9 reported visual illusions. 
The researchers noted that the ones who experienced neither were given the 8 and 20 milligram dose, although the individuals given the 14 and 16 milligram doses did experience hallucinations. So it is hard to say whether this was due to individual differences in the two participants that were given the 8 and 20 milligram doses, or if doses within this lower range are less likely to experience these symptoms. One thing to note here is that the researchers counted something as a visual hallucination, regardless of whether the perception was experienced with their eyes open or closed. Personally, I'd actually want to split out these two types of hallucinations. In my mind, I see closed eye hallucinations as being more indicative of a vivid imagination or enhanced capacity for visualization, whereas open eye hallucinations would indicate a more substantial break from reality. Some participants also reported body image distortions, where their body either felt heavy, light, or as if it didn't exist at all. Talking about their body, one participant said, I almost forgot I had one. It was as if I had just stepped out of it. The other perceptual distortion the researchers noted was that five participants misjudged time, thinking that it was two or three hours later than it actually was. Despite this, they all remained oriented to what the date was, where they were in terms of location, and who they were, in as much as anyone knows who they are, I suppose. Now, the researchers categorized paranoia and reality testing as cognitive and miscellaneous symptoms, respectively, and discussed them towards the latter portion of the results section. But I actually think that it makes sense to talk about them alongside the perceptual distortions because they both touch on separations from reality. Four participants experienced paranoid ideation. The definition of paranoia has actually been one of some disagreement over time, but often includes more than just thinking that others are out to get you, which would specifically be persecutory paranoia. Paranoia can also include other delusional beliefs. As an example, one participant reported that they thought that the nurse was attempting to seduce him. One additional example that I found somewhat, I'll be honest, funny, was that a participant was labeled as being grandiose by the researchers meaning that they thought the participant had an unrealistic sense of superiority, because that participant said the study, quote, was the most important thing going on at the hospital, and everyone should be paying attention to it. I suppose grandiosity is in the eye of the beholder. There were also four participants, possibly the same ones who experienced paranoia, although this wasn't specified, who exhibited reality testing behavior. This is a behavior meant to help you essentially get a grip on reality, sometimes quite literally. One participant clung to the headboard of their bed during episodes of panic and later stated, quote, I felt like I had to hold on to something. It was a way of anchoring myself. Another participant, and personally I really related to this, kept asking for water. When asked why, they said that the feeling of the glass in their hand and the water on their lips felt familiar and were reassuring. The next symptoms to discuss are the additional cognitive alterations. The researchers reported that four subjects were unable to or had great difficulty with verbalizing their thoughts and that seven experienced disorganized thinking. The alteration that I found most surprising was that, apparently, the participants no longer understood proverbs after psilocybin administration. I'll give you an example of what they meant by that. Before and after being given psilocybin, they asked participants to describe the meaning of various proverbs. In one case, they asked one of the male participants before taking psilocybin to describe what a stitch in time saves nine meant. And he responded with, quote, If a situation is getting worse, you should clear it up before it gets much worse. They then asked him to describe the same proverb after being given psilocybin, and he responded, quote, It's about sewing. I'm confused. What time is it? I'm mixed up about time. Now, the authors claim that this shows that psilocybin impairs abstract thinking, but I'm hesitant to take that at face value based on this particular study, especially when they reported distractibility as another common symptom experienced by the participants. I think it would be interesting to re-examine this, and to test using psychological assessments that can more accurately measure abstract thought. Maybe we'll come across research that touches on this in a future episode. The group of cognitive symptoms I found most intriguing more so because of how the researchers talked about it than the symptom itself, were what they called fantasy material. In this section, they noted that three participants admitted to sexual fantasies, but that all three also described having a lack of physical feeling or desire to engage in sexual activity. One participant worded it as, quote, It was all in my thoughts. I knew I couldn't do anything. My body wasn't up for it. I think my favorite line in this article, though, was how the authors ended this section by saying, quote, Another participant fantasied having fellatio performed on him by a girl, and had homosexual fantasies as well. I can't speculate much about the author's intent, but I do like and appreciate that they at least mentioned the homosexual fantasies, because bisexuality should never be ignored or made invisible. 
I am glad this participant felt comfortable telling the researchers about his sexual fantasies and that the researchers included them in the paper. Finally, before moving on to the physiological responses, the researchers briefly mention how psilocybin impacted the participant's affect, or emotional state. The researchers note that the main emotional reactions to psilocybin were either euphoria, anxiety, depression, or some combination of the three. Ten subjects reported euphoria, nine experienced anxiety, and four experienced depression after the euphoria subsided. There was one participant in particular who experienced marked anxiety and panic, who then became withdrawn and non-communicative. I wanted to note this here, that participants were also brought back for follow-up at least once within 24 to 48 hours, and several were requested back for even more additional interviews. This continued follow-up, above and beyond just collecting more data, can be particularly important to make sure that participants are okay after the experiment, and connect them with resources that may be helpful if needed. So similar to the study from the last episode, Three of the measures the researchers examined were pupillary diameter, blood pressure, and heart rate. Interestingly, although they found the same increase in pupillary diameter as reported in the previous study, they noted that only three participants showed changes in blood pressure and only one showed an increase in heart rate. The increase in blood pressure and heart rate were also both seen only after periods of anxiety or motor activity and were rather transient. The other interesting quantitative measure in this study was the use of an electroencephalogram, or EEG, which measures electrical activity in the brain. This is a non-invasive device where electrodes are placed along the scalp and is commonly used when studying brain activity during sleep and to study seizure disorders, among many other things. Compared to EEG readings taken before psilocybin administration, EEG readings taken about two to two and a half hours after ingestion showed increases in alpha waves among four of the participants. Alpha waves are known for being found during wakeful relaxation with your eyes closed and during REM sleep. They don't provide much interpretation as to what this might indicate, but they do note that a similar pattern was reported when studying both LSD and mescaline. I looked into alpha waves a bit, and one theory is that they play a role in the coordination of brain activity across neural networks. Now keep in mind, one thing we learned from the previous episode was that peak effects of psilocybin tend to occur around one and a half hours. So it'd be interesting to see what the EEG readings would look like if they were taken about an hour earlier than they were in this study. All of the remaining physiological data collected during the study was of a fairly qualitative nature. Six participants reported nausea and dizziness, three experienced some mild to moderate abdominal pain or tightness, and five participants reported uncomfortable numbness or tingling sensations in their extremities. They also noted persistent yawning in three of the participants. Overall, whether they were psychological or physiological symptoms, Participants return to normal pretty rapidly, with some being completely symptom-free within five to six hours. That said, many participants apparently reported after-effects, like headaches, drowsiness, and lethargy. So, what can we take from this study? Well, first off, the major limitation here is that this was predominantly a qualitative case study, so the generalizability is limited. Although the results were very interesting, Oftentimes, the symptoms they mentioned were only reported by a handful of the 14 total participants. They also only occasionally referenced the dose strengths, and given the small sample, there is no clear way to tell which symptoms may be a result of higher doses or due to differences in the individual administered a given dose. That said, it does seem clear that psilocybin causes alterations in our sense perception. One of the outstanding questions that I took away from this is what accounts for the variability in responses in terms of experiencing panic, anxiety, paranoia, etc., and how might we be able to mitigate these adverse responses or, as the Zendo Project, a psychedelic peer support service, puts it, help to reframe these difficult experiences into ones of transformation and growth. The authors actually end the article by recommending that future research into hallucinogens should be restricted to a hospital setting precisely so that such difficult reactions can be promptly and safely managed. Although I would argue a hospital might not be strictly necessary, this notion that there should be ample trained and professional or paraprofessional support during psychedelic experiences is one that is commonly reiterated throughout the research into psilocybin. I want to end by talking about one point the authors raised in the discussion that I thought was particularly interesting. They say that the results of this study reaffirmed their impression that hallucinogens in general act in two ways simultaneously. On the one hand, they produce autonomic or unconscious and involuntary physiological effects and perceptual distortions. On the other hand, and this is to me the key point being made, hallucinogens, quote, 
act as nonspecific psychic stresses on the total organism, to which the individual responds in a manner dependent on their basic personality structure, their previous life experiences, and the techniques of adaptation they have developed throughout their life to handle these experiences. That's where I'm going to leave you for today's episode. As always, I really hope you love the show. If you have any questions or feedback, please send them. You can email me at silasibologist at gmail.com, or you can find other ways to reach me by going to the website silasibology.org. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.